I'm not sure I'm going to honor, honor that, but nevertheless, <laughs> it won't be as much fun. So I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, and to be invited here. This is definitely an area of um, interest and uh, source of yelling. Uh, I'm in the, in the same club with Anne, but I've done also some related research. So and uh, the, what I'm going to present to you, so a lot of this is personal opinion, but nevertheless, see what you think. So here are my disclosures related to um, research support. So um, if you're familiar with the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, what we're really trying to do in training, um, in surgical training, take someone from the level of novice and bring them to the level of expert. And what we think we want to accomplish, or what we think we are accomplishing, is that um, when we take someone through their uh, general surgery residency, we, we take them to the competent level, and then maybe with, with fellowship, we push them to the proficient level, and then hopefully during practice, they will reach the level of expertise. Now, I realize that we refer as experts to anybody who becomes an attending, but as you know, that is not anywhere near close to what the term really means. So, but there's a problem, and the problem is that um, it is pretty clear that we produce surgeons of variable skill. Um, there's a number of residents who pursue fellowships, right? One of the reasons is pretty well known in the literature that they do this because they don't feel confident in their skills. There's papers like uh, the one that was published uh, through the Fellowship Council work by Dr. Mata a long time ago, and um, essentially documented how unprepared a lot of the residents are who come to our fellowships. This definitely met with my own experience with surgical fellows, and if you look at the surgical literature, there's plenty of evidence that talks about a learning curve, right? So we, the people publish the series and say, the first 50 cases we had um, worse outcomes because of the learning curve and then we were fine. How appropriate that is to have a learning curve once you're finished, that's for you to judge. But essentially I would argue that what we really do, uh, not infrequently, instead of what I showed you, is this is really what ha what's happening. Um, the residency may be getting them to an advanced uh, beginner stage, uh, maybe the fellowship makes them competent, maybe not, and then practice, who knows. So I will present to you my personal opinion why that happens. So because I think there's a significant flaw of the current training paradigm. So if we assume that we want to graduate someone within five years or whatever you want to call it, one year and X number of operations, and we do want them to reach a level that we all would feel comfortable with, what happens is we get two different people and they have different baseline skills. So this is a normal aspect of human performance. We're not all the same, and that's okay. However, the way the system is designed, and I, th I will, anybody can challenge me what I'm telling you, I think we all, all in this room who are attendings, we have what I call a minimally, minimally acceptable skill level that the learner has to have before we will allow them to take ownership of the procedure and do most of it. If you disagree again, feel free, right? So what happens is as we gain experience or the learners gain experience, the people who are closer to that level that will allow them to take over, they, they accelerate the skill, uh, the learning curve a lot faster. And those who start really bad, stay bad because we never give them the opportunity. Right? So we have them assist, assist, assist. We don't make them surgeons necessarily. And this is, I'm not criticizing, this is for a good reason, right? because we're afraid of our patient and their safety. And then we essentially maximize the baseline discrepancy in skill that existed uh, when we first got them. So your fellow is struggling with technical proficiency and you are struggling with teaching them. I feel personally struggle all the time when my fellow struggles because I, I'm struggling with how to best help them. So what, what can you do? I do want to uh, mention one more thing that I think is important for, for us to understand um, how you can help the people who are struggling when it comes to technical skills. And, and we all need to understand the role of our working memory and cognitive load. And 
first, as you probably are familiar with, whenever we learn a new skill, we go through st different stages. We start at the cognitive stage, and then we progress to the associative stage, and eventually to autonomous stage. This has been well known for a long time. So initially, you're trying to um, understand in your brain what the heck you're supposed to do, and then you st by, through practice, eventually you get to a point that you're really good at it, and you don't even ha have to think about this a lot, right? That's how we develop expertise. The problem is that we all ha rely on our working memory, and our working memory has a specific capacity that is limited. You cannot make it bigger, you, you can get smaller to some degree, depending on the situation, but the problem is it's limited. So what happens is when, when um, you progress through the stages of learning, you have some more spare attentional capacity, which is that working memory is less occupied by what you're trying to teach or what you're trying to learn. And now you can, you can, you can uh, pay attention to other things as well. So the problem is that during the operation, there's numerous demands that are competing for you fellows working memory. And I break them down in five categories. One is the bimanual dexterity, right? So how good they are, because if your fellow is trying to find where the heck the left hand is when they're working with the right, right? They'll consume a lot of the working memory trying to figure out where's my left hand. However, they also need to know the operation, right? So they need to have studied beforehand. They need to understand the steps of the procedure, anatomy, complications, etc. If they haven't done that work, now they, this is also competing on the working memory. They have to be comfortable with the instruments you're using. You're using instruments they've never used. Now they have to figure out, well, what the heck is my hand is doing with this instrument? That consumes working memory. They have to, re to, to learn to recognize surgical planes and really seeing the anatomy, which I, I believe is the most important aspect of the operative experience. The, and then there's also an additive component of performance anxiety. I've seen this with a lot of fellows. The yelling initiates a lot of that, <laughs> right? So, and I understand, and I'm trying to help it. Sometimes I cannot help it. Fatigue can play a role in this. What I would argue is that the open room is not the best place to learn the vast majority of these skills. A lot of these skills need to be learned outside the open room because they're competing with the main thing that they need to get in the open room, which is the recognition of the surgical planes and really learning the surgery. So what are some solutions? Graduate responsibility, I'm pretty sure you all do that very well, right? You don't throw them right away to do the whole case. Uh, you gradually advance their um, um, primary surgeon, I guess, role. Uh, Anne referred to, to this, it's always extremely important. Set clear goals and expectations up front. But I do think we also need to better understand that we need to separate practice from performance. Think sports, right? Um, players in any type of sport, they don't just go and play games, games, games. They practice a lot more and then they play occasionally. We don't do that in surgery for the most part. We mainly learn by performing. Well, we need to change that paradigm if you want to make them really good based on what I presented to you in the previous slide. Encourage deliberate practice. Make them push their performance. We have simulation today. We didn't have it when we were fellows, perhaps. But it is extremely important to really work on the technical skills. I, so for example, the bimanual dexterity I showed to you, that can be improved with simulation. The more they practice, the better they'll get. The less working memory they will need when they work with you doing a case, the more they will learn from that case from you. And use video-based coaching. We have plenty of evidence that this works. Have them look at their videos and look at them with them together and, and, and analyze them and criticize them and tell, and, and tell them. Why? Because you may think, and I used to think, uh, that when you are in the open room and you constantly talk to them, do this, do that, they hear you. They don't always hear you. Most of the time they don't. And you may think they're deaf, but it's an issue with their working memory. They cannot hear you because it's overwhelmed by everything else they are supposed to do. So the best time to hear you is when you're in a quiet place and you can, they can devote you, they atten their attention to you. So, and you can also implement performance enhancing techniques. There's a session later we're gonna, that specifically talks about this. There's mental skills training. We've, our group has done a lot of work on this. Um, I can specifically, uh, if you like, talk more about this later. 
So there, there are um, new um, FLS type simulation models that, are, that uh, recently came out. This, is, this particular one is called Atlas Advanced Training Laparoscopic uh, Suturing. This essentially focuses on making uh, suturing, he has a lot harder tasks to do suturing. Suturing is one of the things that most fellows struggle constantly in the open room, and this can help them really get that to the next level. FLS is not adequate for this. Video-based coaching, uh, recent meta-analysis, clearly favors coaching versus control, right? Numerous papers have been published on this topic, G good quality um, of the papers, um, there's no question that it works. I mentioned briefly uh, mental skills curriculum. We have developed a specific curriculum that, that um, uh, works on the mental imagery, the goal setting, energy management, attention management, refocusing strategies, performance routines. These are all to address the issue with performance anxiety and, and the impact of stress on performance. Um, one of the next sessions, more details on this. So, and last point I want to make is that in the open room, when you want to teach them, the best approach is to stop them so that you can have all their attention. And then you can discuss, and, and according to this algorithm, this is used by SAGES in the ADOPT program. It was developed by a group of colorectal surgeons in the UK. And it really goes back to what I showed you earlier about the, uh, the cognitive overload. So you need to get them their attention to you to make the point, and if this goes too, too frequently, you have to change your aspect. So a plea to the Fellowship Council, um, please implement a technical skills assessment during the selection process of fellows. We don't do it in surgery, we should be doing it, but our disciplines are extremely technically demanding, and, you, and I, I cannot believe that any of anybody here believes that if somebody is bad technically, they'll do fine in, in what we do. So I think that's an important aspect, because if you go back to what I presented to you, um, if you do this, and you, we also work on defining what is the minimal acceptable skill level that for most of us uh, would be, what is the graduation ready level, that's kind of along the lines of competency-based training, what do they, what we want them to look like, then we're a lot more likely to get people who are closer to where we want them to be, to get them um, to where they need to be. If you get the red dot, uh, or the red triangle trainee, you're never gonna be able to get them to where you want them because you only have one year typically to do this. So for us, it's even more important than it is for, for surgery overall. So take home points, fellow struggles with uh, technical skills is common. I'm sure you see it in, the op in your open room constantly. Understanding the interplay between the cognitive overload and learning in the open room is also imp important to help you become a better teacher. Uh, and use simulation video coaching to the max that you can to enhance your fellow's technical skills effectively and efficiently. Thank you.